Hello, Blenders, and welcome. Welcome to episode number 183 of Real Blend, a podcast that hates when the tide washes away all the dead cats. On this week's show, Tom Hanks has a trailer for Finch. Midnight Mass is on Netflix, all seven episodes of it, and that's why Mike Flanagan is returning to the show to join yes. myself, uh, the managing editor here at Cinema Blend, and co host Jake Hamilton of Fox 32 in Chicago. Hello, handsome. Hello, sir. I was going to say handsome to you. Our handsome Scientific. cancels each other out, and we're left with one handsome person named Gabe Gabriel. Kovach. Hi, Gabe. How are you? How's it going here live in person this time? Good to see you. Thanks for filling in the chair. Uh, we are going to be getting to a lot of stuff here on the show, and it's going to be heavy, heavy Mike Flanagan, because we're playing Mike Flanagan Blend, um, and we have the Flanagan interview, which we're going to get to, and then... Uh, but some other stuff to discuss as well, too. Before we get to that point, let's go through some housekeeping. Uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, hello. Good to see you. Thank you for participating in the visual element of the podcast. If you uh, want to see the video element and you are one of our audio listeners, make sure you head over to youtube.com backslash Real Blend, uh, Real Blend Podcast. I was going to say premium for a minute there. Uh, and like, then my, my like. initial visceral reaction was to like lean in and go premium. Premium. Uh, give us a like premium, and subscribe. You don't know what that means. Because we want to, uh, we want to eventually catch up to Gabe's, uh, to Jake's subscribers. Jake, can't you throw some subscribers our way, Mister uh, Hundred Thousand Subscribers? Just throw us some subs. I will throw you. Let's see. You subscribe to me. Kevin subscribe. Gabe subscribes, right. and I think Cinema. So I'll throw you four. Four additional that. subs. Right, yeah, it's going to help a lot. Every uh, bit counts. Have you signed up for Real Blend Premium? If you haven't, you're missing out on a lot of really fun stuff. A Monday show uh, that's additional to the main show. A newsletter from my oh Gabe, I got to write a newsletter this week. Um, a newsletter from myself, uh, and an ad-free version of the show, which means you're going to miss out on my uh, reading of. Uh, I got to read a live uh, or a, uh, an ad recently. Yeah. That was a lot. I actually enjoyed doing that. That was kind of fun. But you don't want that. You want to sign up for premium. So go to um, re- let's see, cinemablend.com backslash real blend premium. We even try to we tried a game uh, where we ranked the Spider-Man movies recently using a tier system. And it was a lot of fun. It was and, fun. Uh, as controversial as you might imagine. So, um, it's hard to folk. agree. Go check it out. It's hard to agree. We had it, uh, a lot of people were commenting that we had too many S tiers, which personally I agree with, but they yes. reflect like every individual's. Did we S-tier. end up with three of them? I think we ended up with three. Yeah. <laughs> that is too many. Here's, here's how I know it's successful. All of us kind of walked away annoyed. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, which is which is <laughs> wait until we as... do wait until we do all the MCU movies. No, well, well we're I... going to do them by phases. Well, no. Yeah. So here's the, we're going to do them by phases, but we're going to do them on the same list. So like an episode will be oh, phase one necessarily. Interesting. And okay, then we're yeah. going to come in with phase two and add it to the phase. So like at the end of this, it's going to take ten years for us to do as well. It's I'm not sure that there is an S until phase three. To be honest, this is what you. we'll find out. Cinemablend.com slash real and premium. Find out. Yeah. I'd be hard pressed to find a. I'm going to have to look back at the phases. I don't remember exactly where one starts, another one ends. Well, and I think, honestly, I think Star Wars is what's going to break this show. It's going to be hard, yeah. That one's going to be real. I don't even want to think about it. No, (laughs) I'm kind of looking forward to it. Uh, Let's get to the weekly poll, and I will throw it to Jake. I worry about our friendships on the other side (laughs) of the Star Wars ranking. (laughs) Yeah, it's going to be nasty. Um, The weekly poll this week was, did Ted Lasso win dot, dot, dot? And Jake, your options are, well, actually, Gabe, how many Emmys did Ted Lasso win? Um, I think the, the common phrase is all of them. But uh, <laughs> well, I, don't, I don't know how many I'll look at. surprisingly lost uh, writing and directing to Hacks. But okay. I, I'm, I'm a firm believer <laughs> that the like reason were, they lost sounds like you're those... critical of whoever won. They lost <laughs> well, no, 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 writing I, and directing I to a bunch hacks. of Hacks. I've heard Hacks is fantastic. Hacks I, is I do, actually great. I've heard it's great. Um, I, and I, I think Gene Smart is, is a master class of just human beings. It um, was... Nominated for 20 Emmys and it won seven is what I'm seeing from the official. But also you have to keep in mind that there were some categories where they were multiple with people each other. were nominated. Yeah. yeah. And I, in pretty fact, much that's every supporting really, actor was yeah. nominated. And that's why I think it lost writing and directing because they had multiple episodes up against each other as opposed okay. to, I believe, Hacks just had one episode in each category. Okay. That's Which, granted, not to take away from Hacks and not to say it wasn't deserving, but that's how you divide your votes is when right. you give them a lot of different options. Sure. So the options were, mm-hmm. and Jake, first off, tell me what you think the audience said, and then okay. I want to hear your own opinion. Cool, cool, Did cool. Ted Lasso win too many Emmys? 
uh, just right, the just right amount of Emmys, yep. or not enough Emmys? I think people are going to say just right. Okay, you're Because it won so many, I can't imagine anyone being unbelievably horribly upset that it didn't win like directing and writing right 53 percent of the people said just right yeah um, that's where i would fall too I, I'm, I'm assuming you'd probably agree with that yeah again i have not seen hacks therefore I'm, i don't feel right saying whether or not it should have won writing or directing um i do think the writing and directing in ted lasso is phenomenal um but gene smart feels like it's, it seems like she makes great choices i can't imagine her picking something that doesn't have great writing and directing um and i i wanted sudeikis to win i love that, that hannah won supporting actress um supporting actor one was tough i mean i love the the guy that play the, the guy that plays roy kent oh, yeah, he's um, and he's fantastic. great in he's season so two great. this is only season yes. one right this is correct. All, yeah correct. season two he's but even I, better. I also do love what is it brandon hunt does with yeah. with coach beard he does so much with so few lines yeah that i also think that there is a talent in that but because his maybe coach beard isn't as flashy of a character but there he has some line deliveries that I find funnier than anyone else on the show. There's a joke that you laugh at still to this yeah. day. To this day. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's, yeah, it's a joke in, in season two where he's sleeping in, in, in the locker room and someone asks him, like, are you, are you sleeping here? And just without missing a beat, he goes, but perhaps to dream here. And it's just, the mo- it sounds stupid, but it's just the most, de- his deadpan instant delivery. He's great. That I just, I lost it whenever Wait, he my, it. Uh, my favorite comment on the YouTube poll was, who the fuck is Ted Lasso? Oh come on! <laughs> really? I well, refuse been, to believe that you might have follow. Been a joke. Yeah, yeah. I refuse to believe that you follow a, a real blend account, but don't know what Ted Lasso is. Well, wait, it's possible it's an international audience. We do have international yeah. listeners. Yeah, they might so. not know what Ted Lasso is. To be honest with you, and we get a lot um, of um, like Cinema Blend's larger audience playing along. With also, to be fair, but we've talked about Ted Lasso quite a bit on the show. For sure. Yeah, that person have might not you, listen to the show. Have either of you seen? the latest live ish episode which is all about beard yes yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. that's great I mean, that's that's one i would submit for him specifically next, next year, year. He's got in next consideration year. I, I kept thinking not to give too much away that it was going to end up being like one of those weird tony soprano dream episodes well that's yeah. what Sopranos. michelle kept asking me throughout it she's like is this stuff really happening yeah. or is it a dream and i said no i think it's yeah. i think it's all actually happening so i loved it i thought it was really really clever so. And he, you know, he wore those pants to the Emmy after party. Oh, did he? Really? Yeah, there's a picture of him at the Emmy after party wearing those pants. That is terrific. Yeah, this is such a great show. So, um, listen, I guess I would fall towards uh, it didn't win enough Emmys because I really would. I'd like to say it win just about everything. I think it's, I think it's the most entertaining show on television right now. I don't know if it's the, I don't know. If, I can't necessarily argue it's the best that's why we don't play best though because then now you're like you're crossing yeah. categories and you're like well this drama made me cry is that sure does that have to be better no, than I'm this gonna, thing i'm gonna made throw me gabe under the bus he gabe texted me earlier today and asked me to choose a best he did he did that to me too i text both of you guys yeah, oh! yeah. no i was yeah. curious I feel less special it wasn't for the game i was just curious yeah. like what what would be different it, because it was answers it was our answers different uh we'll find out oh that's him okay <laughs> well <laughs> Speaking of really great television, uh, there's a there's a series out on uh, Netflix right now called Midnight Mass, and uh, it's directed by a friend of the show, Mike Flanagan, written and directed by by Mike Flanagan. So uh, we reached out, knowing that he had a show coming out, and asked him to come back. If you haven't heard our previous interview with Mike Flanagan around interview the time is, of uh, the selling it short. <laughs> Yes. It w- How long was it? Two hours? It was like ninety minutes, almost two hours. It was more okay. than ninety minutes. But it was around the time of the Dr. Sleep director's cut uh, getting released. And so we get into deep into that and The Shining and his filmography. So go find that. It's on YouTube or it's wherever all of our old uh, podcast episodes are. And now we have a new one. Uh, And not just with Mike, but he's also joined by his producing partner and frequent collaborator, Trevor Macy. Uh, So it was a lot of fun to get those two together. And so um, without further ado, the Real Blend interview on behalf of Midnight Mass with Mike Flanagan and Trevor Macy. Hey guys! They are. Hey, guys. hey. hey there he is. Good to see Hello, you guys. gentlemen. Good to see you. Good to see you, to see you guys. Hi there. How the hell only, are you guys? We're only doing because so well. 
only because we've been to LA a bunch of times. I know you guys were at the London hotel. I can yes. tell, I can tell by the, by the shades. I just knew it. <laughs> we do way too many junkets. That's how too you can tell. Junkets, yeah. uh, <laughs> guys, seriously, thank you for joining us. I'm going to kick us off. All three of us absolutely love this show. Mike, I've been geeking out with you the past few weeks about this. It's the best show I've seen all year. It's the best show I've seen in a long time. So seriously, thank you so much. Uh, right. Mike and Trevor, what I, what I want to talk to you guys both about initially is the difficulty in promoting this show without spoiling it for the fans, because there are so many things here that none of us want to ruin for anybody. You guys are in the middle of a press tour right now. I want to talk about how you talk about this show without talking about it. And then also in a way, give props to Netflix because Mike, you were right. You told me something earlier, which is that most studios would put certain aspects of the story on a poster or in the trailer. And if you watch the trailer, there's none of really what the show is about in it and i'm just curious what that means to you guys to not have it ruined for people well everything yeah it's and and you're so right netflix i think did such a beautiful job marketing the show because they've managed to sell the show for exactly what it is without telling you exactly what it is (laughs) uh that is that is a tightrope Um, but we were floored by what they did. No, I mean, look, they were super collaborative, but the two things I can always say about marketing that I think are my favorite things as a viewer and also my favorite things as a producer, are they, is is, is the campaign intrinsic to the show and is it confident? And Netflix did such a good job on both those fronts that because they are absolutely selling the show for what it is. They've crafted it so carefully that they, they, they've edited it so well. The, what, what they did with the music and the trailer, like they, they've just, to me, like if I had nothing to do with the show, I would lean in and I would be interested in seeing it. And I wouldn't know what it was about, but I'm not sure I'd care. And we, yeah, it, that is an exciting and weird challenge as we talk about it, as I'm sure it is for you guys, because there's stuff we want to talk about and we can't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like it, it would it would be depriving someone of uh, something they hopefully would really enjoy as it, you know, as it happens organically in the show. So it's like, we talk about the show a lot uh, through the lens of, of the characters. We talk about the mysteries a lot. Mysteries is the, yeah. M- the word mystery probably comes up more than any other word. Um, <laughs> Just like it does the teaser. But we keep saying, you know, yes, it is a horror show. And, and yes, you're going to get, what you want to get out of that, but it's also got an awful lot else going on and it has a lot to say and we can't tell you what that is. <laughs> um, so November 1st, we'll have you guys back on and we can yes, just, we, yeah, that we, can talk, we can, we can <laughs> talk about everything. Good. Good. <laughs> um, thing is, you know, we, we're going to, we're begging people to kind of, as they discover the show and go through the show to keep, to keep things. But uh, I like stay off social media if, if you're not watching it in the first couple of days, because right. I really feel like a lot of this stuff is just going to avalanche out there. And, you know, I hate it as a fan when I come across stuff like that, because I'm just a few days late catching up on something and I see a picture on Twitter and I'm just like, thanks. That's yeah. Gave away the whole thing. A hundred percent. hundred percent. Um, the story has so many characters, um, as you guys were saying, all of whom are, are extremely vivid and rich characterizations. I think one of the things that's most amazing about just the first episode uh, is how much we learn about each of them uh, and the way that it really catches you up to speed with a number of different stories. But I'm really curious. Uh, the, the show opens with a particular character. I won't mention who it is. Um, but back when this was just a blank slate of an idea, uh, which character was your entry point into this story? At the very beginning, it was Riley, um, mm. played by, by Zach Guilford. And Riley kind of represented, um, in a lot more ways than I was even aware of at the time this all started, Riley represented uh, an avatar for me um, in a lot of ways. And uh, you meet Riley um, in the pilot, and I, I don't think this is spoilery because it's, it's no, the first it's, thing. Yeah. Uh, so I think we can, we, can, we can be safe here, but you meet him kind of enacting what really was my biggest fear. Uh, mm. that maybe the thing I was the most afraid of in my life, which was uh, as, you know, as I was first starting to write this, um, I was dealing with alcohol, but had not yet gotten sober. Mm. And the, the fear that really, uh, that really kind of had me by the throat wasn't that something would happen to me or that I'd hurt myself or that I'd, uh, die in a car accident. It was, it was that, you know, what if I killed someone else and lived? Mm-hmm. Um, and that was the deepest, darkest kind of fear that I could imagine. And so Riley 
that that's that's where we start. Um, and that character from the jump for me was the way in that was, he was the one through which we'd experienced the story. Um, and we'd have to, to do that with a character who we meet, um, under kind of the, the worst possible situation that, that I could imagine. Um, but yeah, things, things do change a bit, um, uh, as it goes along, but, but that, that he was, he was the starting point. Thank you. One of my favorite scenes uh, in, in episode one, actually, is when the kids go up to the uppers uh, and they're talking about Harpoon Harry. And, and it's like the, the, a legend that you may have heard when you were a kid. Like, I, I think we all had that growing up. I, I would go to scary spots with my friends. We would talk about the legends like the Money, Bunny Man Bridge or whatever it was where I was growing up. What were those legends for you guys? What, what, what were those places that you used to go to as kids? And what were the horror legends that you heard about? I'll go to you, Mike, first and then Trevor. Uh, so I grew up uh, in a number of different places, but there are two big ones I'll talk about. One was in uh, on Governor's Island in New York when it was a Coast Guard base. Um, it was this tiny little island. The only people that lived there were Coast Guard families. So we would leave every morning and the kids would run amok and dad would be out on the boat for months at a time. And so mom would be doing her best, but then we'd come back at night and it was kids on bikes and we would just go off and explore. And there is an abandoned Civil War jail. Um, on that island called Castle Williams. And nice. it is terrifying. Um, it's awesome. And so we were convinced that there was uh, ghosts of uh, Civil War soldiers that you could see through the barred windows. And there'd be a lot of dares about trying to get your head. Yes. Bars and like trying <laughs> to get your head. Um, so that was a big one. And then the other one that uh, stuck with me uh, like crazy, I lived in Maryland a good amount of the time, and the legend there was around these train tracks, and it was uh, the Goat Man, um, and goat yeah, man. it was it, it was a, a really fantastic urban legend, and this is in Bowie, Maryland. But I've heard variations of him all over the East Coast, in particular, but yeah, the Goat Man. Uh, I had a goat man. You had a goat man? I had a goat man. <laughs> he lived on the other side of my fence. You know, <laughs> Trevor, That's did you have any? So I moved around a ton as well, but the, the one that, that like, I had a super local one that is relatable to a movie that somehow jumped to mind when you said this, which is, so I saw Aliens and I didn't see Alien until it was later, but I, when I, I was just kind of going to see movies by myself and I went to this kid who's a couple of years older than me who I really liked, looked up to. And he's like, you know, there are aliens in the parking lot. And it was this new <laughs> parking lot with all this exposed piping and all this concrete and it would go in the dark and, you know, I, I went to my car by myself right after seeing the show and I was freaked out. And <laughs> I had to go back three separate times just to prove to myself. I was actually kind of hoping there were that they were there part of me, but which I think explains why I do what I do. But, you know, I had to go back and like disprove to myself that there were these aliens in the, the, the parking garage, which I, as I say, it is the most improbable thing I've ever heard, but somehow it really resonated. <laughs> Cool. Trevor was just ready to scream, get away from her, you bitch. He was ready to go. <laughs> he had the line cocked, ready to go. Um, Mike, I know you've been working on this project for a while. Um, I'm curious about its relation to uh, Stephen King's Revival, which you were thinking about doing an adaptation for for a while. If Revival had ended up happening, how would it have affected Midnight Mass? Because a lot of people would have been would have said, like, oh, is he doing two projects in a row that involve churches or religion? Or, you know, would one have affected the other? No, I, it's funny. We talked about that a lot when we attached to Revival. Yeah. And when Revival was published, I went and grabbed, I always grabbed the, the New King on day one, but I particularly was running fast for this one because Midnight Mass existed for, I think, six years before Revival was published. Mm. I wanted to make sure that we weren't in trouble, that, that, that we weren't stepping on. Yeah. You know, and they're, they're two completely, for anyone that's never read it, they're two completely different stories. Yeah. And, and so I read Revival and my first thing was, okay, who we're okay. This Midnight Mass is safe. We're not, we're not treading in the same territory. Mm. My second thought was, boy, I'd really like to make Revival. <laughs> um, and so. Uh, yeah. So we called Steve. And, yeah. Uh, and there was, there was a period of time where both projects were coexisting on our slate and they would have gone kind of back to back. Um, and the exciting part was, oh, we're going to get to use a lot of the same notes because we're going to have a charismatic priest. We're going to be asking some very cool questions about the afterlife in particular. You know, I think the questions and the answers that Stephen King is playing with in that book and the ones we're playing with in the show are very different. Yeah. I was really psyched to talk about what he was talking about, though, um, in Revival. Uh, you know, the um, 
the fundamentals, I think we were fine on, uh, but it would have been really neat if we got to do both. Um, one of the things that I always felt really good about was that, yes, um, if these things were to come out within a few months of each other, there might be some fun parallels to draw, but that they wouldn't ever step on each other's toes. Um, and I still really hope to see revival someday. Yeah. I wish we could make it and maybe that'll come back around. You know, they, it did with Gerald's game. Yep. We, um, we were doing Gerald's game and then we weren't. Then we were again. Yeah. So it, you never know. Um, I love revival and uh, that is walking down a path. It's interesting because the biggest thing I could do to answer this question would be to cite two pieces of literature um, and say Midnight Mass is this one and Revival is this one. Oh. Um, and I can't do that because <laughs> it's going to spoil stuff. But, um, what, I can, yeah. what I can say is there, there's sort of naturally occurring uh, bits of optimism and humanism and empathy in um in midnight mass that express themselves very differently than they do in revival yeah okay and you know i i, I think that would be kind of a key tonal difference for us if we were to do both of them but you know midnight mass has uh you know asks a lot of questions with a lot of empathy yeah and revival i think was always like we, we, even when we sold it like when we when we sold the pitch on it yeah. it was like this is our version of king's riff on frankenstein mm -hmm. right uh, and I think that it, when we talk about the lineage that we could point to on, on mass, it's a very different one. It is. Sure. Sure. Um, Mike, I was uh, the Leonardo DiCaprio meme when uh, you came up. I, I was like, hey, hey, there's Flanagan. <laughs> uh, oh, you, you actually spotted me. <laughs> oh, I spotted you. Yes, I did. Yeah, so that makes my day. <laughs> I joined SAG for that. So, that did insane. you really? Did you have yeah. to join SAG? I, you had I, a line. I, because you had I a talked. Yeah, I, I I got to join SAG. Um, so how do you choose uh, your cameo part? How do you choose where uh, you're going to cameo? As an actor, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, this was just, it was just a really fun thing. I usually don't like to do that. Um, I, I don't often fight to get like there are a couple times I drove the cab that dropped that picks up uh, Carla in Hill House. Okay. Um, like little things like that, that it was like, this is this is a fun chance to be part of it. And I did that uh, for Carla, actually, and, and spontaneously. Mm -hmm. That, yep. that was a, I'm still wearing I'm in the wrong clothes for that time period. And I think mm -hmm. somebody had thrown a, a, like a flannel on, mm -hmm. on me as I ran in, but we didn't have somebody for it. Um, this time, this, this series was so personal to me. Um, I really wanted to be, I really wanted to be in there somewhere. I wanted to be part of it. And I actually have three cameos. Yeah. I was going to say, did you catch the other? Yeah. No, no I did. Well, to be I honest, know. I've only, I've seen, I've seen the first four episodes. Okay. So. okay. Um, well, you've, you've seen one of the others. You've, you've seen two, two of, of the others. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Okay. So I'm, I'm, so at first I thought I'm just going to be in the background of a shot in the pilot. And you can see me when Warren and, and the boys are riding their bikes and they pull up in front of Lisa's house. Okay. Uh, there's a neighbor across the way leaning on, on the porch with a cup of coffee and that's me. Oh, okay. Um, and that house, actually, the, the mailbox, our department had put my name on the mailbox. So the oh, okay. house on the island. Um, and I thought that was it. And that was like, that's plenty. Look, I'm on the show. I got to, I got to, I got to run into Frank. Um, but then uh, when for the longest time, the other scene you're talking about in episode three, um, it's a sequence of, of the show that we didn't know we were going to film. Um, it was yeah, Mike, gonna... had, Mike had written it and, mm -hmm. you know, we ended up sort of cutting it from the in initial pass for budget reasons. And then Netflix came back and said, hey, we'd really like you to shoot. We'd this. like to do this we, after we, all. You, were, yeah. you, you know, you're right. The show's better with it. Right. Do it. Um, and so for that sequence, there was a chance uh, they were like, well, we're going to have to cast this part of this priest um, and just for a line or two. And um, and I forget someone had said, like, you you should just do it. And I said, you know, what? I actually would like to do that. And I jokingly say, if your character had been able to do his job properly, none of this might have happened. None of this would have happened. <laughs> that's the other thing. I immediately. I came up with a whole backstory for this dude. There's a lot going on that, is, that didn't make it in for various reasons. Into the cut. Various. Um, because I decided my character, <laughs> name is Pope Incognito, and he's not a priest. He's the Pope. 
and he's on the run. <laughs> There's a whole lot going on. And, and Hope Incognito, I think the show would have been richer if we'd incorporated more. <laughs> um, but, you know, executives. So yeah. Hope Incognito yeah. just became this young priest character uh, who just has a little moment. But it was really, really fun. And it, it was a great chance to just kind of to really be part of the world of the show for a second. Um, and then my, my final cameo um, that no one will ever notice uh, is that the show makes a lot of use of hymns, mm. um, traditional yes. Catholic hymns. Uh, and so on a number of those, I was able to sing uh, as part of the choir on the hymns. That's amazing. Oh, that's cool. Wow. I love those and in the show. Those are incredible. They and are mixed in a way. They, yeah. They are mixed in a way that, that the, they just feel louder. They feel more atmospheric. Yeah. They like reverberate in your soul when the hymns kick in. It's fantastic. It's a I, great touch. I love the hymns. I and I love what the Newton brothers did because yeah. they're they're singing like uh, Taylor and Andy, who we've worked with now, pretty much my whole career. Yeah. Um, you know, they were just singing. They were laying all the tracks down, like recording them in their cars and putting them together. And and uh, and I loved it so much. I asked if I could be on the track with them and you can hear me pretty clearly in the, in the finale. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, um, so that's my other weird cameo. I, I was an altar boy. I was in the choir. I grew up singing these songs. I learned how to harmonize by playing around with it just at church growing up and wow. was, hymns are such a part of my DNA at this point. Um, I, I really wanted a chance to sing them and they are that's beautiful. Amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. Thank you job you know mike I, I i've always found the the way you the way you tell stories to be incredibly immersive and a lot of that immersion comes from these incredible wonders that you do obviously hill house episode six had some of the most incredible wonders i've ever seen uh there's a seven and a half minute wonder that opens up episode two uh in this in the in this series that is absolutely mind-blowing and i and, and i was wondering if you could just speak on the challenges of shooting that scene. Um, I, I guess we could say you're on a beach, if that's cool, we can say that, but just in terms of like the way that shot was executed, how hard that was to pull off, were the seagulls CGI, how the hell did you even time all of that? Uh, you know, um, I'm, after episode six of Hill House, I initially said, we're not, we're not doing that again. Um, and I don't think we ever do, are doing it that way again, like on that scale. Um, but this was a scene as um, we were working on the scripts, that just felt like it made sense to do it that way. It, it's a sequence in which you have a bunch of people from the island on a beach. Um, there's a huge event happening and everyone's kind of realizing it and talking about it in real time. Um, and it felt like this is one of those rare situations where a scene felt like it would be better to approach it without a, without a cut, to, to drop the viewer in the center of the island and in the center of that moment and have them kind of suss it out. Um, we prepared it very much like we did 106. It yeah. was the same uh, camera operator, uh, James Reed, who shot 106 uh, for us on Hill House, is, is operating the camera here. Tim and Yari and I did what we always do, and we, mm -hmm. we planned it out. We shot second team rehearsals. We went and choreographed it without the actors. Uh, and it really felt like a muscle that was comfortable. Like, I don't yeah. really recall it being... It was a lot yeah, less... Um, um, I mean, first of all, it was only one. You didn't have to stitch six together. So it was a lot. And of, it was only seven and a half minutes. Yeah, so it like... Only. So like, only. Yeah, like, <laughs> only. <laughs> the white knuckling on, on Hill House was pretty remarkable after you get past like minute 16 of that one. Um, but this one was a lot. And the actors had such a blast doing it. Uh, and yes, the seagulls are CG. Se seagulls are CG. Um, um, okay. They, they look, look good. Real. Uh, well, they, they, we had so we have you know really good in the trailer. Yeah, we have we trailer. have all these cats, these carcasses of cats on the beach. The challenge was that the tide was coming, and we had to build a, the whole shot around the tide schedule hmm. uh, because once it moves, it moves really fast. And so we had to get in, get out the crew there, get everybody ready, and we had this tiny window to shoot. So we had to rehearse, rehearse, rehearse as we chased the tide out, and we kept moving further down the beach. Wow. And we didn't put the cats down until the end because they'd float away. The tide would come in and grab them and take them out. Oh, my uh, God. We have a couple of takes where you can see the cats starting to float away. Zach Guilford well, ran into the water after one because they were 
Um, and, and the problem is they aren't full cats because they're supposed to be buried slightly in the sand. And so they're they're, like half cats. if they move, you can see that they're flat on one side. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny, the, the thing I remember most about that day isn't, you know, because uh, we, we were hoping for overcast weather. It was sunny. That was fine. Uh, we had airplanes. We had a bunch of sound problems because there were planes taken off just because we were in Gary Point Park in Steveston. It's very, very crowded. Mm-hmm. Um, we were seeing, you know, every possible angle and in, in 360 degrees of, of, of the town, the whole cast was there. What I remember is that that's the day um, Zach Guilford's son was born. Yeah. And Zach was running in between these seven minute takes uh, to, to check in and, and to FaceTime. To those, FaceTime yeah. for the- oh, my God. Wow. Um, that's awesome. And so that to me is when I think of the stress of the day, it was all there. It was too. Yeah. Cause we, yeah. we couldn't, you know, his uh, yeah, he couldn't be there. So, um, and uh, try, try as we might, cause you don't know when the baby's going to come. So yeah, it was, uh, that was uh-huh. for us, but he handled it like a champ. Yeah. And, and it was one of those things where like, as soon as this was done, he was leaving Canada as soon as possible to, to get there. And this was like the last thing. And, incredible. and he just, you know, it just happened to be a seven and a half minute water. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but it was awesome. And I, re- I recall uh, Rahul Kohli and Michael Truco, who carry a lot of the first kind of two thirds of the shot, mm. were not with us on Hill House, um, but who had seen it. Oh, yeah, they were, they were terrified. And we were like, dude, you're going to be fine. Like Hill House was a yeah, lot harder. Seven minutes. You know, <laughs> seven and a half. And it's lit by the sun. We're not <laughs> flying in like a bunch of lights and lightning and rain and all this mechanical stuff. Like this is, this is way easier, guys. And they're like, what are you talking about? This is seven and a half minutes. If one of us messes up, it's like, if, yeah, if you mess up, we, we have to abandon this. And you really can only mess up twice tops because the cats will float away. But no pressure. <laughs> Um, <laughs> the half cats and the, the loose half cats will fall away. Half cat. the f- yeah. Flat half cats. I'm surprised you didn't put a fake a fake up tremble on the beach as well. Yeah. Like just, <laughs> just bury a fake up to mess with them. <laughs> Everyone knows. Um, Trevor's aware of fake up. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh trap. Oh fake up tremble. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, and and if the um, any any take you blow, you're really only taking Zach away from one of the most critical moments of his. <laughs> his life so no pressure, no pressure. <laughs> um, but it, it it actually went very smooth and it's a it's a stretch where as soon as we were done it was like all right we got that take it was very early in the shoot if i remember it was and it was the second week and it was, okay great we we've kind of climbed that mountain we're good and and it, it put a little boost in everybody's uh step after that because we kind of you know put that one behind us and and we're victorious with it, um, which you never know if you're going to be when you start a shot like that. So, um, and then it didn't look like a thing until months later when we finally saw it with the with the birds. Mm. Um, when we were there, you know, and, and he's kicking at the air, and we have to keep saying like, "Remember, actors, there are birds all over the place that are swooping down." Um, and they're like, "What do I do?" You know, it's like, "I don't know. What would you do if there's a bird there? Just look at it." Just, just watch it. Uh, I would um, run. Look like a thing. Run. Yeah. Way later. Wow. Wow. <laughs> um, obviously, both of you guys love using sort of like a, a core cast of actors. It's great to sort of see familiar faces. I did not recognize Henry Thomas till maybe like the third episode of the show, which is <laughs> unbelievable. Um, I'm curious what happens when a project doesn't call for one of your regular actors. Like it has to be great to call one of the guys and be like, hey, you're coming back. We need you for X, Y, and Z. But whenever you know I don't need this person for this project for one reason or another, do you still make a phone call to let them know? Like, how, how, like how does that work? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, and it works very much with your family. Um, we don't have something for you on this one. We absolutely will catch you um, on the next thing. And please don't, you know, please don't, uh, don't worry about it. We also have the other side of that. We have actors who say, I'm not available. I really want to be part of this, but I've got this other job I'm doing, or this just isn't the best time for me personally. Um, I don't want to give up my seat at the table. <laughs> yeah. If I don't do this show, does that mean I'm never working for Intrepid again? And we have to go to them and say, relax, everything's fine. And of course your, your family 
go, go do your thing. We'll get you back. And that happened on this one with uh, Carla, with Carla. Um, who uh, had a conflict when we were casting it and was booked out on, on a show. Um, and so Carla, you know, uh, cause we, we were like, yeah, we'll, we'll get you into the show. This would be great. And Carla couldn't do it. And it was like, great, no problem. We'll catch you on the next thing. And you hear Carla's the judge in the pilot. Uh, you hear her voice. Oh, really? Oh, oh, wow. And so there are ways to kind of be like, you're still here, you know? Right, and right. If it's was, not. was she going to play Zach's mom? I'm trying to think of who she was going to play. We the- never got that far, actually. Oh. We, we never kind of identified what character she was going to land in. There were three or four I thought would have worked. Yeah, she could have played several things. Yeah. The doctor, I, I would have guessed the doctor, yeah. maybe? Oh, yeah, it's good. The doctor character? Yeah. That was on the table at one point as a, as a potential uh, short, and I think we talked about Annie. Mm-hmm. Um, but one of the things, we hadn't gotten to, we hadn't gotten even that far before she raised her hand and said, just based on when you think you're going, mm-hmm. I think I have a conflict. And uh, we'll ping our people as soon as we have a green light and an idea of when we're shooting and just cool. say, mm-hmm. we don't know yet who you'd play. We don't know yet if you're going to want to do it, if you can, but this is the date. It's like a save the date. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Mm-hmm. And we'll come back with the details after that. Uh, I, I hate this has been so much fun talking just about the filmmaking process, but I, I before we run out of time, I have to go. I have to go deep with you guys, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, there are different times throughout the course of the four episodes I've been able to watch where I, I've been like, is this the work of a devout Christian or is this the work of an atheist? Like, I cannot really wrap my brain around it. And we get to a point where the phrase uh, God works in mysterious ways is used um, in a way that it, that I never expected it to be used. And I, I kind of want to just ask, like, as people who are telling this story, what does that phrase mean to you guys? God works in mysterious ways. That's a big question. It's a big question. Big question. Um, I think part of what was important to us with the show was that whether you were a devout Christian or an atheist or a Buddhist or Jewish or um, Muslim for sure, Muslim or sure. Scientologist, mm-hmm. you know, whatever belief system or lack of belief system that uh, that you have um, aligned with that the show should be just as engaging, um, challenging, uh, and not necessarily be trying to espouse one point of view over another. That it's not a show about religion, theism versus atheism. It's a show about um, faith itself and how corruptible that can be. Mm -hmm. Um, How fanatical thinking and fundamentalism can distort any belief system and not even religious ones that we can see it happen in politics. We can see it happen in the scientific community. Um, Personally, you know, one of the things that you're seeing here is that I was raised Catholic. I was an altar boy. Um, It was a very huge part of my life um, up until a certain point when um, I started to question everything and went out to learn as much as I could about world religions. Mm -hmm. And about, I think Riley says at one point, he says, I'm going to look for God. I'm going to look everywhere. That was how I felt. Um, I have since landed at a place where, you know, I I said agnostic for a lot of years. I said uh, atheistic because I felt like I needed to put, you know, my money where my mouth was. I think um, I've said secular humanism, uh, the most spiritual point of view that I connected with the most at the tail end of this huge kind of near decade of research for me um, was Carl, uh, Carl Sagan um, mm-hmm. became a source of incredible spiritual meaning to me. Um, however, what you're seeing uh, when you say, is this written by someone who's a devout Christian or an atheist? The answer is yes to both. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. what I thought. Um, the, well, uh, and that's what the show is too. It's not, I mean, the, the values at the core of the show um, you know, our empathy and kindness and moderation. And those things are Christian at their core. Mm. Um, but they're also secular humanist and they're also, they also can be Buddhist, atheist, and, Buddhist and, Muslim and Muslim and everything. And, and, yeah. and it's, the, if the show does anything, it's kind of comes down the side of, of moderation and kindness as opposed to, you know, strident fanaticism, you know, mm. and that's, in any in any of its forms, but the show is meant to ask more questions than it is provide answers. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of it was um, in the writing, a fun exercise of trying to argue both sides yeah. 
as earnestly and passionately as we could. And uh, provide a balance because we don't want to see, I mean, this is the kind of any show that that has that features a religion can, you know, draw attention of a certain kind, but the show sure. doesn't mean to be anti religious or pro religious. It, it you know, it looks at both sides. It absolutely does. The smash cut from the Eucharist to the AA chip, Mike, was the I, I actually applauded in my in my house. Uh, <laughs> that was that was fantastic. All right, so Mike, we're being told we have a minute left, so I'm just going to throw this out to you really quickly. Um, because and, and this comes, goes back to the wonder um, about in terms of like the dead cats. I was wondering in terms of like there there are, there are people out there who are very big cat people, very big dog people, and I just wonder when you when you have a show that has that element in it, and there's a dog scene that's pretty gruesome as well. Is there a, a, a moment in your mind where you're like, are people going to turn this off if it's too gruesome for them? Or did you get any pushback from Netflix going like? Hey, maybe dial it back a little bit. I was just curious about that. Oh yeah. So Trevor, the I, person who'll turn it off is Trevor. Yeah. Yes. Um, I have an animal lover. Um, yeah. You know, I don't. That believe- dog scene was hard yeah. to watch, man. Yeah. That was that hard, hard to watch. Well, if we showed you the puppet, it would get a little easier. Yeah, the dog <laughs> puppet's kind of hilarious. <laughs> we we need to get the fake Jacob Tremblay and the fake dog together for. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we called the dog Robo Pup. <laughs> and uh, and Robopup. Uh, and Robopup is a mess. Um, we forgot to put his hindquarters in, which we thought would happen. Like he was supposed to have a whole dog to carry and it had no butt or legs. And so um, it, got, it got hilarious. But uh, I think, you know, much, much, like the, much like the religious question, it was important for us to equally attack dogs and cats um passionately <laughs> uh and brutally i um i think i i find it upsetting and i've always gotten a little friendly that you can kill human beings and like teenagers like young people you can just kill them and yeah. people are like, Woo! and they're like eating their their oh. milk duds the whole time and then like a dog is in trouble and people spit out the candy and they're like you better you better not. <laughs> it, it, it's, I've already gotten some of this just since the trailer came out. It's like, there's a dog in the show and people are like, you better, you, oh, you. Um, but the thing that I guess the big thing is when it came to cats, you know, I hate working with cats. They, they're undirectable. They don't care. And I think they're, they're like that in life. Like they're not, they're not, a dog will work with you and like connect with you. And a cat's just like, fuck you, man. <laughs> And we directed cats out a number of things. I hate it more every time. Um, <laughs> By the way, we could do a whole other episode on uh, all of the cat stuff we've ever tried. All, I mean, between you know, Lassie and Doctor Sleep and Bitch the Cat in in Hush, Hush yeah, Princess, yeah, uh, like oh my god. So so like the to to fill the screen with dead cats to me was just like cathartic. <laughs> <laughs> that's the sound bite right there we got it <laughs> we got it no cat was harmed all the cats were loved and oh, too late too yeah. late mike no nope. um, it was funny because it wasn't just like we're not just going to kill a cat like we're going to we're going to kill all, all, all of them gary Oldman style um, it's fascinating to me that 200 cats and one dog seem to have the same weight here. Oh, right. And, and I'm, I'm just putting that out there, not to, not to offend cat lover. Uh, we, we didn't ask about any of the humans. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 Like, Had it coming. Yeah, but they're, yeah. Fair, they're fair game. Right? Humans are fair game. The animals <laughs> are innocent, except for cats, yeah. who are not innocent. <laughs> Um, cats know what they're doing and uh, uh, so yes yes we, we should do it we should do an animal retrospective at, at some point of the intrepid animals that have that have graced our, our screens but, uh, well we are being told uh, that we're out of time and I, I hate out that too what are, what well, are yeah. you out on uh, basically we're, we can't top that so yeah. we're just going to stop <laughs> Yeah, we're stuff. good. <laughs> but it's such a pleasure to have you guys on. And uh, and honestly, if you if you really do want to come back and talk spoilers, uh, because you know we would love to have you guys on when you can when you can openly gush. 
Absolutely, guys. You know, I always love to always love to chat with you guys. Yeah. So let's do it. Very cool. You guys enjoy. You guys. Take care. We want to thank Mike Flanagan and Trevor Macy for joining us on the show. You guys need to definitely check out uh, Netflix's Midnight Mass. So that explains the the dead cat joke at the beginning <laughs> of the show, in case people thought that that was insensitive. But now you know how Mike Flanagan feels about cats as opposed to dogs. Um, just great to have him back on the show. I, th- I think these they're not interviews. They really do just break down into conversations. Um, he's such an interesting guy. He's such a fascinating filmmaker. And that's why later on in the show, when we play uh, Mike Flanagan blend, it's going to be really complicated um, to get into. But uh, yeah, and and even with that too, Gabe, I want to get your perspective on this. Like, Mm -hmm. I thought it was hard to to even figure out where Midnight Mass falls in his body of work because it's uh, it's still so fresh with us, right? Like, he's not a snap judgment type storyteller. Right. This is something I guess we'll get into because we're going to review spoiler free midnight mass later and that'll lead us right into the flanagan blend um but that was i think that was what made it hardest trying to make that pick was Mm -hmm. just how recently that is how good it is Mm -hmm. and uh it's like beyond good like it's it it like connects with you on such a great human level that uh, it's very special it's a very special show so yeah i that's what i'm I'm struggling between that and another one um on what i want to pick that's how make your pick soon that's, have, I'm working. I'm working on it up here. We have a show to get to. All right, let's get to talking points. And I'm going to start here with a movie that Jake Hamilton was very much anticipating, uh, probably at the top of his must see <laughs> list for 2021. And we saw a trailer for Tom Hanks's Apple TV Plus movie Finch, where a <laughs> apparently dying Tom Hanks uh, is building a robot to care for his dog. And on paper, that would sound like everything Jake Hamilton would want to see in a movie. So, Jakey, now that you've seen the trailer for Finch, where is your anticipation level? I don't know. It's just... Yeah. It's just a different-looking movie okay. than I had in my mind when I read the description for the... I mean, I remember, I remember we talked about this movie at the live show in Washington, D.C., when we were talking oh. about our most anticipated picks. I wow. said, you know, I think I said for 2020, ironically enough, I have said, I think my, my pick is Dune, but let me tell you about this. And this was 2020 we we're talking yeah. about. My pick yeah. is Dune. Uh, and, and which, which we're still hasn't of, opened. Yeah, We've which still hasn't it. opened in 2021. We've seen it. Yeah. <laughs> it hasn't opened yet. Uh, but there's this Tom Hanks movie. And just, yeah, the, the idea of... A man knows he's dying and is probably going to die before his dog. So he builds a robot to make sure his dog is taken care of. Just like that's heartbreaking too. Like that is that is all of my all of my triggers being just 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 pushed all at the same time. Mm-hmm. Tom Hanks, Tom Hanks dying, Tom Hanks' dog being left alone <laughs> because Tom Hanks is dead. Like that's just it's a lot. It's a lot for me to yes. handle. The the, tr- the tone of the trailer makes it seem much more of like a all like a Turner and Hooch kind of adventure through through a wasteland with with Chappie along for the ride. You guys kept making Homer Bound. It looks like Homer yeah, Bound. oh yeah. You guys kept making Chappie <laughs> jokes, and I kept firing back, being like, "That's not what this movie is." Yeah. And then I saw the trailer, and I go, "Oh, maybe that is what this movie is." <laughs> it just it I, it's just a completely so, different film, and I really hope that it's just a a poorly cut trailer in terms of what that's, the actual movie is. That's what I think it is. It very much feels like a, most of the tone from that trailer comes from the very Disney, like early 2000s Disney um, score, like soundtrack that it has. It's a very like kind of poppy. Yeah. It's all the, of, honestly, yeah, it's all the music. Yeah, it's, it's all, all the music. music. That's, yeah. and, but on top of that, the director who made this, his previous work, um, oh, no. are episodes of Game of Thrones, oh. Altered Carbon. Oh, um, wait, it's um, I True know Detective. It is. It's um, uh, under the dome, fringe, some a bunch of TV repo men. He made repo men. So like, it's not a guy who makes Disney movies. Yeah, it's okay. Miguel, isn't it Miguel's spot uh, chick? Yes, or, or some Sapuch- so, Sapuchnik, Sapuchnik? He directed like enormously popular episodes of Game of Thrones. So I, I maybe he pitched and pulled a U turn and he's like, I want to make uh, a Disney version of Castaway. Um, I doubt it though. I, to me, I think it's really the trailer and it doesn't surprise me given that it's apple that's putting it out and they're probably trying to appeal as many people as they can with Mm. a tom hanks they want a family tom hanks movie um and this might hit those threads as thematically uh, but the trailer itself 
leads itself down some really dark paths of one like we're discussing like i, I think the trailer doesn't even mention that tom hanks is dying it just is in the description yeah, yeah. which which is so really they, they avoid like, that. Wait, did i read that wrong yeah but it also alludes to them um on was, their travels true. like running into other humans which mm-hmm. you know you think of like the road and things like yeah. that like, those are very that, dark that always interactions. tends to get into a very dark like i i will say yeah whenever that plot point came out in the trailer i sort of went like oh that makes me uncomfortable particularly when there's a dog involved yeah like all those things you could take down the tone of the trailer but i get the sense that that's not the trailer and i get the sense looking at uh you know the guy whose previous work was in the art department on train spotting is probably yeah. not making a disney movie that's, okay <laughs> so, like, you, you <laughs> have you have restored my confidence in this film gabe the we'll see one that. scene that makes me think that it's not going to be this uh, Cormac McCarthy adaptation that you're all <laughs> hoping for is the dog reaction shot. Mm. The dog reaction shot is the laziest uh, inclusion in any film whatsoever. And I learned this from a man named Lawrence Topman, who was the daily film critic at the Charlotte Observer. And he taught me a long time ago that any time a film has an animal reaction shot, it should lose a, a star instantly. If but, we were okay, ever in a Sean, screening... I don't, I don't remember the shot. Tell me, yeah. is, is it like straight up a dog being like, mm, or is it yes. a dog looking the at dog something? The dog comes no. to attention. Yes. The, He's the, like, what? Tom Hanks says something, the robot replies, and then the dog goes, uh-huh, and then the trailer cuts away. Oh. Like, it's, it is very yeah. deliberate. But again... You can recut those reaction shots to sure. be like yes. the dog. The dog reaction shot is the ultimate. Uh, I forget what that tested that Russian film test thing. But like you can put a dog reaction shot to anything and whatever was before and whatever was after it, it will be whatever it needs to be. You know yeah, what sure. I mean? If yes. the dog's about to get shot, like you could put those it's scenes the in. It's, visual, oh my God, the, the visual record scratch. It's it's, the record, it's, its, it's own thing. Scratch. You're absolutely right. <laughs> so they could scratch. they could put it like again, the trailer. They wanted to make it fun or whatever. But in the movie, it could be. Tom Hanks just fell over because he's having a heart attack and the dog, yeah. <laughs> they just needed the dog to be like, what's going on? And Yeah, it's, Sean, you're going to feel really it bad. It feels different. If this so, is the moment if, Tom Hanks dies in the film. But, but Sean this, is right. In the trailer, it is, they are awful. It looks like, what's that uh, Harrison Ford movie that came out? Call of the years? Wild. Call of the Wild. A couple of years ago. It was like 18 <laughs> months ago. Yeah. It feels like seven years ago. What if point. the director of Finch sat down to watch his trailer and was like, what the fuck? <laughs> the I, what is it? He might have. What did you do? <laughs> this is my do we even know? And then he says, do don't worry, at least it'll be rated? right when it's on the big screen. Oh, it that's is rated, a point I want to get to. It is rated PG-13, but it's also two Ooh, hours for thematic long. elements? For thematic <laughs> elements, I'm not sure. But it's almost two hours long. Um, the other cliche that, that Mr. Topman warned me about, which now I can't, anytime it's included in a, oh in a movie, I instantly, <laughs> I almost want to get up and walk away, is, is when a person is saying, I am absolutely not going to do this thing. And then the and very next scene is them gun. doing it. Oh, just the worst. It's the worst. I can't, I can't see it in a movie now without yeah. immediately wanting to. My, that's I a, want a movie to come out where it's a guy saying, I am not going to do this thing. And then the dog goes, hmm? And then, and then smash cut to... Best picture. That's a trope that, <laughs> that worked once. The first time that that happened in a movie, the audience was like, oh, that's hilarious. He said he yeah. was going to do it. How <laughs> ironic. And then it never worked again. <laughs> it never worked again. Uh, so here's the question. Is Tom Hanks now just a streaming talent? Well, didn't he sign a deal with Apple or something like that? I'm not sure. Did he? I thought he had a deal. Maybe it was just this. Maybe it was just the rotating number of films that he's had. Because he also had... Um, well, Grey, Greyhound he had. Um, yes. Which, but this movie was a universal movie. And it was called Bios. Yeah. And they sold it off to Apple. Okay. Assuming, assumedly because they looked at it and said, Tom Hanks isn't going to get people into a theater anymore. So sell it but off to Apple. It, in a weird way... Isn't he, and I super felt this when Greyhound came out, Tom Hanks is not the the theatrical draw that he was in the 90s or even that he was in the 2000s. But to me, he could be the quintessential massive draw on streaming. Like, I think when an average person at home sees, oh, Tom Hanks has a new movie on Apple or Netflix or whatever Mm -hmm. the case may be, they're going to press play. Like, my, my dad was all over Greyhound. Right. Like, was all, like, that was, you know, that was very much, he probably wouldn't have gotten up and gone to the movies to go see it, but he was jacked to press play whenever it came out. Here's a question. If he didn't have Apple TV, would he subscribe to it because they had a Tom Hanks war movie on it? My parents wouldn't have a TV unless I made them. 
It was, <laughs> it, like it's no, like my way, my bad. My parents are, are, you know, like they have all, they take all my accounts, they have all my logins and everything. So it's, yeah, like, yeah. it's hard to judge. Probably not. My parents would probably, if my parents had to pay for stuff on their own, they would probably have maybe Netflix and that's it. Okay. It's kind of sad that Tom Hanks is at a stage in his career where he is. If you have the streaming service, you I press think, play. I think that's they just got an where Oscar the... nomination last year, man. For what? For, for a beautiful day in the neighborhood. That was last year. We got an Oscar nomination last year, so the the movie came oh out. Oh my in god! Yeah, nineteen. We are a tip for that. Yeah. He lost. But that's it. but Sean, I think that's just circle. where that's just where the movie star clout has gone. We've discussed Fair. this ad nauseum, but like that's where the movie star Fair. clout has gone. Where yeah, yeah. What streaming the battle that streaming has won is that for most families, most people, on most nights, they at some point will sit down and start to scroll yes. through whatever streaming services they have, looking for what they're going to watch. Like that. Sure. That's a thing that's now a part of our culture, as opposed to dialing up you know your local theater and finding the showtimes like no one does that anymore yeah. uh so yeah. having tom hanks face with like brand new movie you've never seen before starring tom hanks on your thing is a big win and a big draw for people who are scrolling trying to find something to watch i think that's the that's the difference versus okay. what tom hanks yeah. draw is but just where the draw is uh, uh sure. useful effective yeah. i mean because remember like I, it wasn't that long ago that we scoffed whenever a big name was going to television like oh my god, sure. like they're doing a TV show. Wow! Like yep. I think we're gonna get to a point where like no, that's just that's just where people are going. That's just where the way it is. Yeah. You know what movie would pack the theaters for Tom Hanks if he were to do a sequel to um, Road to Perdition, but it's Road to Perdition. Uh, no, <laughs> nothing. I like it. Thanks, Gabe. Appreciate it. Uh, here's a movie that is not... I wish Kevin was here. <laughs> I need Daenerys in the frame going... Mm-hmm. Uh, I needed you to shoot some shots so I can start cutting into the podcast. <laughs> um, a movie that absolutely will not go to streaming in any way, shape, or form is The Tragedy of Macbeth, uh, directed by Joel Cohen, starring Denzel Washington and Francis McDormand. Um, it's not coming until December, I want to mm-hmm. say. Yeah. <laughs> but she looks really it's... annoyed. <laughs> I think it's playing the New York Film Festival tonight or tomorrow. We're recording oh, wow. this on a Wednesday. Um, Hope they so don't we spoil might start what getting <laughs> we might start getting reactions <laughs> to it at least. Uh going into this trailer has a new trailer coming out. Uh, very, well, very short. It's like a minute yeah. long. Uh, I, saying, I, I honestly thought it was one of those like trailers for a trailer where yeah. they're like the full trailer's out tomorrow and then I was like, "Oh no, that's just this is that's, just it." Just yeah. it. Um, yeah. I I didn't know this feature was in black and white. Did we know this? Neither did I. I didn't know it was black and white. I didn't know it was four by three. Yeah, that's a big that's a big thing. Yeah. I know. I saw, I saw someone tweet like, "Are y'all really excited about a black and white four by three adaptation of Macbeth?" And uh, to yeah. to us or just they tweet? No, that just in to, just to Twitter. In oh, general, I was like, have yeah. they heard our show? Yeah, that's our bread and butter. On paper, though, I do understand like that's that is kryptonite yeah. for modern audiences. <laughs> but you know, those two together in a Joel Cohen film is pretty remarkable. Um, I thought the imagery looked great. You know, I'm sure they're both going to knock it completely out of the park. The trailer doesn't give us much of anything beyond, uh, hey, it's a Joel Cohen film with these two guys, <laughs> with these two actors, and it's Macbeth. So it's like, what do we need? Yeah, I don't yeah. need you to. I don't need you to tease the third act for me. Yeah, <laughs> but, but even in that, even in the the imagery shown, I still there was like at least three or four shots where I was like, oh man, that's oh it looks gorgeous. Yeah. That looks yeah. remarkable. And have we ever um, gotten like a co- from either Coen Brothers or them together a literal adaptation of something like this? Like classic I don't think literature, so. they tease, like, they oh, play like, oh, a brother lot. With was it. oh yeah, oh brother was yeah. Odyssey, and yeah, and and Serious Man was the Book of Job. But they often play with sort of. Yeah. classic tropes or classic storylines or like old brother obviously yeah is there is there any part of you that is and i don't mean to sound ignorant okay. like i kind of have i don't i don't have the easiest time with shakespearean mm. like verse mm-hmm. like oh, it's not that's, that's, like I, most I, people are that way I, yeah. i'm pretty sure that like I, i'm pretty sure i could watch it and appreciate it and understand what's going on and for the most part i i, I think i know what happens in Macbeth, but like it doesn't translate a hundred percent fluently to me as it does with some people like is there any part of you that's a little concerned about it being a literal adaptation what's the what uh, if you're going to shoot it in black and white and you're going to do it in four by three why be concerned about that is my thing like it feels like i'm just talking about like from like you as me personally yeah you personally i guess i don't know i i um i wouldn't say like, like, like even like baz lerman's like romeo and juliet beautiful love, love it gorgeous love it. but like 
there's a part of me that like I really have to like input the subtitles on, and I really need to like to get every because obviously the the dialogue back then is different than how we speak today. So it, you know, I don't know, like I'm just curious as to how you guys feel about that. I think that there's a real rhythm to Shakespearean dialect, like mm -hmm. obviously a reason that it's as, as renowned as it is. And I think it's when people in adaptations mess with that for mm -hmm. the benefit of being different, that that's when I, I can find it jarring because then I'll find like the Tempest jumps to mind, like Julie Taymor's the Tempest. Mm -hmm. um, and while it isn't uh, a Shakespeare film, but like Shakespeare in love, the way that it was, um written and presented i get into the this the rhythm of that dialogue and it works for me that way and i kind of feel that in the hands of denzel washington and francis mcdormand they're going to figure out how to do it properly yeah, that's a good yeah that's so good i'm less concerned uh about that but i i do understand what you're saying in some people's adaptations it comes across as a little bit too stilted or a little bit too dry um, and it doesn't sweep you up in it, but that can happen to, like, I'm trying to think of the, um, what was that period drama that had, uh, Margot Robbie in it recently? Uh, Mary Queen of Scots? Yeah. Even something like that. Like it's not Shakespearean, but it's yeah. the way that it's presented. Mm -hmm. But it was like, something like that crashingly still, boring. Still, at least the dialogue is easier for me than it mm. is. Um, did you guys, I never saw, I, I, the visuals looked phenomenal, but I never saw the Fassbender Macbeth. Did you guys ever see oh, that? Oh no, I didn't. Neither say it. did I. I. I do. I need to catch up on that because the visuals yeah. do look amazing. Yeah. And that was wasn't it the same year as Blade Runner, and they both had that like. That's that does. They sound both right. had that like, uh, which this kind of plays with obviously yeah. in black and white, but that like sort of washed out desert orange so, scene. Someone, they, I remember um, those parallels. Tweeted, uh, like four very very striking, beautiful, colorful images from the Fast Spinner Macbeth. That was like, how did we sleep on this movie? three or four years ago, but we're all going nuts over a black and white four by three version of yeah. Macbeth today. And I was like, well, I, because it's a Cohen brother exactly, and it's Denzel yeah. Washington. Yeah. Like <laughs> that's yeah. amazing. I honestly forgot that Fassbender even had that adaptation yeah. to be honest with you. Fassbender has taken a, an interesting turn in his career. He's not, he hasn't quite turned into the actor who I thought he was mm. going to be. Isn't that the director? Didn't he shoot that back to back with the same director for, um, Assassin's Creed? Isn't that right? Oh, Oh, interesting. I think it's the same director, and they shot Macbeth, and then they immediately went into. I saw neither. Assassin. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think they assassinated. His and career. I think that's honestly part of the problem. Like, I don't think. I imagine when you're making an Assassin's Creed movie, all of your energy, as far as promoting, is probably going into that one if they're both made at the same time. So mm. that might be a part of why people slept on it. Well, on that top trailer... of the Shakespearean hill that you have to climb in order to enjoy it. <laughs> that trailer reminds me, though, that we have some really exciting things coming. Uh, it's the end of september now basically yeah. we're hoping that october november december are jam-packed with really really fascinating films to come including dune uh which we will talk about as we get closer doesn't, to it doesn't it feel like dune came out like a month ago yes shut up you saw it i don't want to hear that oh you haven't seen it yet it's great <laughs> oh. you should it's really good it's really good what are you waiting on I'm going to bury you in a desert. Is what I'm gonna do. <laughs> uh, let's get to this week in movies. I forgot uh, gay bastards. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I didn't forget. I remember. <laughs> uh, the Eyes of Tammy Faye is going wider. So if you want to hear our review of the uh, Jessica Chastain, Andrew Garfield adaptation. Well, not, not adaptation. Biopic. Biopic of uh adaptation of real life <laughs> of real life of <laughs> the story of jim and Tim Faye baker yeah. is it though is yeah. it though um i ran we randomly we were eating dinner uh out and ran into a family that we knew from michelle's school and they were like oh we're all gonna go see the eyes of tammy Faye." and i was like are you like it just struck me as unusual but again i forgot it's a charlotte story i was gonna say there's a big oh, there's fair. yeah it's a local yeah, yeah. it's a huge they local story but with so much stuff going on did was, you look to see if it stunned. if it did well in your market i'd be curious if it did exceptionally well uh, how can you tell can you break it down by market i think you can uh, break it down by state i, I, I found out recently um and only just because i was told um but i think of the top 10 highest grossing individual theaters around the country when Candyman came out that like five of them were in Chicago. That okay. makes sense. Which makes me sense because it's again such a which which is why I think Gabe's absolutely right and that I, I wouldn't surprise me if some of the most successful theaters were in your backyard. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised either. Um, I want to get to Dear Evan Hansen though because I don't think we talked about this uh, as a show. Jake, did you see it? 
Uh, not the movie. I've seen. I've seen the stage production. Okay, and Gabe, you haven't seen this. Did you get a chance no. to see the movie? Did they no. play in, in St. Louis? Kevin uh-huh. did and said he liked it. Am I, am I incorrect in that? No, he, that sounds right. Yeah, I think he. I think he connected with it. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember. He would probably qualify by saying it's not yeah. perfect and he didn't love yeah. everything about it. Sure. But I remember him being. He, he really connected with it. So I'll go out on a limb and talk about it because Michelle and I watched it the other night, and um, while I think that it has problems it's definitely a lot better than i thought it was going to be going into it Mm -hmm. um it comes with a ton of baggage for various reasons um and jake you could probably talk to this about the show itself Mm -hmm. just um, the just the the, i just the plot plot. yeah well well, start start there could if you could because there might be some people who are listening to this who don't even know what dear evan hansen is about so i I don't want to get into the details of how this ends up happening. Sure. But the plot involves uh, a young man in high school who commits suicide. And through what is kind of a misunderstanding, the parents of that young man come to believe that he was actually friends with a young boy at the school named Evan Hansen. Mm -hmm. But that was not the case. But and Evan Hansen is kind of a loner. He's kind of awkward. He's, 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 working with his parents and working with a therapist to try to get better. He writes letters to himself every day, which is where the title of the film comes from, because every letter he starts with is Dear Evan Hansen. And through this misunderstanding, Evan Hansen all of a sudden starts obtaining a lot of attention and kind of a lot of popularity from parents and from the students at school and from the girl he kind of has a crush on. Mm -hmm. And it all comes from people believing that he had a relationship, a friendship, with this young man who committed suicide. And the problem that people have uh, with, with this plot is how far along Evan Hansen goes with this lie, mm-hmm. with this ruse. And that the end of the musical, and I haven't seen the film, um, but the end of the musical, he never really has like his comeuppance. He never mm-hmm. really, ha- like there's an admittance of wrong, but he never really has like that come to Jesus. Like he does something that is honestly horrible. He, 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 it's horrible what he does. Mm. And there's never really that moment where he has to own up for this horrible thing he does. And in a weird way, it's kind of excused because it's, well, he's dealing with a lot and he's, he's kind of awkward and, and, you know, he, he kind of needed this from people, but a lot of people would go, okay, sure. But that's no excuse for this horrible thing that you did. Mm. Um, so I think that's people's, that that's, I'm sorry, that's a very truncated version of, of no. why some people seem to find the plot problematic. I think that 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 hits on it enough. And um, I, so I had a chance to, I, I watched a, I probably shouldn't say this. I watched a bootleg copy of the, sh- of the stage show. Uh, it's on okay. Vimeo. You can, you can search it on I Vimeo. I thought you were going to say you watched actually... a bootleg version of the movie. And I was no, like, no, no, no. Oh, <laughs> That's like, Jesus. Uh, after watching the movie, I wanted to see how it played on a stage. Sure. And there are elements in both where, because I specifically wanted to see what you are talking about. And there are there are moments in the movie where, at least to Evan's credit, he does say, you know, pretty early on, I didn't write this. Yeah. And it gets glossed over in a way that, like, the parents don't want to believe that he didn't write it. Um, and I understand that. Because I was, I was also really bothered by that point if he just accepted the, um, the praise and ran with it. But he does try to make it clear of, like, I didn't write this. <clears throat> and he has a friend who's not even kind of like a friend who does say to him, like, are you really going to let the, these dying, uh, the, the parents of this dead child think that, you know, he did that he didn't have a social connection that he didn't have. Like, it's almost he makes an argument that's like, it's a little bit better if you just go along with their story, you know. Um, and so I didn't put as much blame on Evan Hansen for that decision. I almost felt like he was backed into backed into that situation because he wanted to do what was right for these people. And it does, it escalates and balloons out of where he's going to. The other controversial point about this movie is the fact that uh, Ben Platt is playing him in the film. And Ben Platt is 27 years old. An actor who played a college freshman in a film 10 years ago. Yes. Um, And he's 27 years old and he's trying to be a uh, high school student convincingly and is wearing (laughs) a wig that um it doesn't i like in that bootlegged stage version of the show he has normal hair uh like he just and i don't understand why they put this curly wig on him it's it's really distracting 
way more distracting than his age. The age thing in the film never took me out of the story or the musical. And in fact, Interesting. Interesting. I found him to be so convincing in the part, you know, with the songs and the way that he portrays. Like, I think you could argue that Evan Hansen is on the spectrum a bit. He's super uncomfortable in social experiences. Um, he's even uncomfortable having conversations with his mom. He has no real friends. And I thought that Ben Platt played all of that in, in the film beautifully. And so I was, my argument would be, while this is probably a really great role to give to a young young actor, an up-and-comer, to maybe give their spin on it, Ben Platt has been with this character from, you know, the writing and the table reads. So if you're going to do the musical, he knows the character better than anybody else. And I thought that he he was, I thought his portrayal was amazing. His, after the movie, while I thought, the reason why I don't think the movie is great is because the way that some of the musical numbers are staged, mm -hmm. not because of the people in them, but the way that they're directed. And I think that they're a little bit clunky, but his singing, you know, his performance is sure. off the charts. Good. Sure. And I couldn't, it's, it's who are those guys? Uh, it's, uh, Pasek and, and Paul, the guys who are did the greatest the, showman. The La La Land? They did, La La Land uh, guys? they did greatest showman. Did they do La La Land too? That sounds right. Um, I, I, th I, for some reason, I thought the cell of Greatest Showman is that it was from the writers or from the songwriters. Right, that sounds right. Yeah, they write the catchiest tunes. I mean, like it, the music I mean, waving, is tremendous. Waving through a window is a great song. Yes, and wh whatever the middle one is, it you will be found. You will be found. Yeah, which that's, is that's, very that's much other, like yeah. this is me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, from Greatest that's, Showman. Oh, that's a great. That's a great comparison. So I had no real problem watching the movie in saying that Ben Platt took the part, you know, sure. or, or played the character, because I honestly do believe that the character is his, that he has some ownership over it. And, um, you know, whatever things they did to kind of de-age him and, and if, yes, he doesn't look like high schooler. Yes. I totally understand. <laughs> I totally understand that. Yeah. But the meme of Steve Buscemi showing up with a skateboard over his shoulder, <laughs> you know, how do you do fellow kids is a little, <laughs> was a little harsh in how this played out. So I hope that people give this movie a shot because um yes you, you're right that subject matter can be a little bit uncomfortable yeah um and but it, it but it worked as a show you know it's clearly a, a, a it's a tony winning mm -hmm. sensation and i thought that bringing him over and and bringing that music over was was adequate so um so i i liked it i liked it um the the way i want to talk about the staging of some of the songs though there are really long sequences where one character is singing and the other characters in the scene are just sitting there staring at them, <laughs> which is really weird. Like one in particular is a family dinner. And in the middle of the family dinner, Evan has to break into a song. And the likes of Amy Adams and Caitlin Deaver have to just sit there in the chair staring at him as he sings this four to five minute song. And I was like, as a director, couldn't you come up with something else to sort of transition away from just watching them sing this song? So, um... But again, not enough to take me out of it. I would actually recommend it. If you're a fan of the show, I think you're going to love it. And um, and the songs were still in my head. They're still in my head now, you know, uh, a week or so, a week or two after seeing it. So um, you're Evan Hansen. It's out there now. I, it's not going to be the awards contender. People were thinking that it might have the potential to be. And in this year of musicals, it might not even, you know, be remembered as one of the better musicals of the year. There's a lot of stuff still to come. But, I mean, the um, fact that, I mean, I loved In the Heights, and the fact that we're not even talking about In the Heights in the Oscar conversation at all, to me, is kind of astonishing. Nobody saw it. Really. Yeah. All right, uh, Netflix. There's a movie called The Starling that I know nothing about. Jakey, what is this? Um, so The Starling is uh, Melissa McCarthy and Chris O'Dowd. Mm. Uh, the film starts with uh, them having uh, just had, uh, I believe, a baby girl, and, and they're be they're happy, and, and the baby girl's healthy. And then the film flash forwards a jump of time. Um, Melissa McCarthy is alone in her home, and Chris O'Dowd is in uh, a mental health facility uh, because uh, they lost their child. And um, Chris O'Dowd, it, there's a very interesting line where Melissa McCarthy says, my husband didn't handle it so well. And someone says to her, and you did. And it's just a really interesting study of grief. Um, Chris Klein plays uh, a, a help for Melissa McCarthy. And the reason it's called The Starling is because all of a sudden there's 
this bird around her home it's just kind of a pain in the ass it kind of just mm. keeps giving you know and it becomes a symbol of things later on in the film um i most mccarthy and chris o'dowd i think are honestly watchable and, and they they have great chemistry together um most mccarthy has made projects that i think she is better than but even in those projects i find her to be in incredibly watchable and likable i think she's a great actress i do love when she does a little bit more dramatic work um i think this has a really nice blend of drama and very serious topics while also having like touches of chris o'dowd's wit and melissa mccarthy's charm and humor i was gonna ask between the two of them and kevin klein like surely you get to laugh at some point oh yeah yeah (laughs) there are definitely moments that i actually audibly laughed out loud and and chris o'dowd has some great lines and and also, I think a side conversation we need to have one day, which is why we are, and I'm, maybe it's a personal choice. Maybe he just picks and chooses what he wants, but why we don't see more of Kevin Klein these days, who I think is like one of the most like just Kevin charming, Klein. watchable. I think you saw him in person, didn't you? Sort of. I got to do, I guess I saw him like this. Um, I got to do, I did a class on him where we studied him because he's from St. Louis. Um, sure. And we got to do like these two sessions where we, talk to him over that's cool over i mean i get he has an oscar so i can't say like oh people don't appreciate him. i get but, like, the sense though yeah that he's kind of um he, he's happily married to phoebe yeah. cates and he they both had long careers and he's yeah. like he does stuff when he wants to do it like yeah. he did like a french film about chess um a number of years ago and like i think he just takes projects when he wants to but he's not sure. he's not like dying to work yeah i'm glad and you fact, clarified I, kevin klein because jake initially said chris klein and oh, I did I say Chris? Did you say Chris Klein? Did I say Chris Klein? And I thought that's an interesting oh. choice. Yeah. <laughs> these, these two guys really like Chris Klein. <laughs> yeah. No, so I'm, I apologize, Kevin. Uh, Academy Award winner Kevin Klein. I apologize. Yes. Amazing. Um, wonderful. Yeah. It, great. Yeah. Great actor. And yeah, I mean, he didn't do the junket for the film. And whenever I reached out to see if he was doing any press, I'm like, yeah, he's not really doing anything. So I think you're absolutely right. And he kind of just does whatever he wants to do and does the film, and then says, "All right, peace out. I'm going to go." Um. It's look. It is. It is what I would call the quintessential like perfect like saturday afternoon netflix film to press play on uh Mm -hmm. if this were a movie opening exclusively in theaters i would say that's a bummer because this is more of a streaming kind of film but the fact that you can press play on it i think you know i I don't think you will regret it watching it okay uh speaking of things that you can press play on starting right now let's do it why are you watching the show (laughs) what are you doing uh midnight mass is is Available on Netflix, all seven episodes. The latest from Mike Flanagan. And Gabe, I want to start with you because you have a PSA for people that I think that they need to hear. Yeah, I think we've discussed on the show before the balance between like um, bingeable shows that get released all at once and versus the some of the shows that come out weekly. And I think we've all, depending on the show, we kind of fall on either end of like it kind of sucks that something will drop at midnight and you have to go through the whole work day yeah. or like part of your weekend dodging stuff um Hmm. however it is worth it that you as best you can stay off of social media stay off of twitter mute things don't pay attention to the world until you can find time this weekend or as soon as possible um to watch all seven of these episodes because there are as we've discussed in the in the interview and i think we've alluded to several times over the past couple weeks there are some major, 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 major surprises that are extremely rewarding when they are surprises um, that the filmmakers and Netflix have been kind enough to not put in the marketing, mm-hmm. which is a huge thing. So and and who knows? It, it could be the sort of thing where Friday they start putting it in the marketing because it's like it's out now. You know, I've seen studios do that where like that weekend, if you didn't buy a ticket, they're already just yeah. here's yeah. the third act, you know. Yep. Um, so even be careful of that. But up to this point, they have not spoiled anything and so i i think if you are interested in this if what we discuss about it what you've heard from the interview gets you excited it is worth making time uh, to see it as soon as you can because it is incredible so here's what we can say about what it's about in case you're even curious just like what what it is even sure um to me it it plays very much like and this might not mean anything to you if you haven't read a lot of his stuff but a stephen king type story Mm -hmm. where it's set in a coastal town um does it ever specify where I think it's Northeast. It, I can't, it, it reminds me of uh, another reason why it's very Stephen King, where it's it like, seems like it would be off the coast. Like a New of, England type. Yeah, of, like yeah. off the coast of Maine, off the coast of... Which is very uh, much his... Yeah. Flanagan's whole milieu is like, he's born of Stephen King. Like that's mm-hmm. a lot of his stuff that's, that's not directly adapting Stephen King. He's always yeah. like, yeah, yeah, but he's 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 who taught him horror. And yeah. so it's... Yes. He just yeah. rides that it's, and In the same way that you, you know, you watch kill bill and you see the influences that tarantino 
had on the movies he watched growing up. You watched Flanagan and go like, okay, but but neither yeah. of them rip off the person. You can just tell that they oh, yeah. were in the best possible ways a storyteller can be have yeah. been influenced. A lot of people have tried to copy Stephen King over the years and have failed miserably. Flanagan gets what works about Stephen King and takes yeah. that and runs with it. Absolutely. So part of the reason why I asked him in the interview about who, which character was his entry point into it mm -hmm. um, is because there are so many fascinating characters yep. uh, in the story. And you could honestly choose to focus on the majority of them and say that it's their story, you know, or their arc kind of thing. But he singled out this character of Riley, uh, who is a, a young man who had a tragedy early on. And it's is revealed in the opening scene of the first episode. Uh, and it's how he's coping with it. Um, it's, it's, uh, we see the event and then it's four years later from the event, uh, and he's returning back home to this island community. Um, and he has to go through, uh, a number of different things to sort of get his life back on track. But, um, it deals with his immediate family. It deals with, um, a lot of people in the, in the community who have their different issues. And then the, um, the other, I guess, strongest, more, uh, most prominent, um, character would be the um parish priest the the head of the local church that who is um a, a replacement who has come back over from the mainland because the existing monsignor uh, who they sent away on a trip is uh, has fallen ill and is not going to be able to return to the island and that sets the stage and i think that that's honestly i don't want to go much further that's, than honestly, that. that's about as far yeah no yeah. i think i think beyond that we can kind of talk in the abstract in the sense of like uh thematically what it talks about uh, part of why it's yeah. so wonderful is not it, it's not just wonderful in the sense of like hill house hill house has very human elements and and that's the brilliance of flanagan is is story and humanity are the king of his stories and he mm -hmm. puts in the horror elements to that and this is the case of like technically yes it's great the horror and sort of suspense elements that are there are top notch but what what brings it above the rest is what he says about humanity, what's he, what he says about the human experience. Yeah. And in this one, he's tackling, as he alluded to, or as he discussed directly in the, um, in the interview, he tackles directly addiction and, and sort of that and recovery and, and that aspect of his own life in this. But he very much is discussing religion and faith, um, the belief in religion and the, uh, I don't know how you would phrase that, not believing in religion. Mm -hmm. Um, in a really interesting way where it doesn't feel they talked about it in the interview before I could watch all of it. And they said like, you know, they wanted to present it as sort of like a conversation and not like, Hey, we're, we're presenting this idea above the rest and we're setting up the conflict to sort of debate those two. And then you, you get to a point where it's like, this is the winner. You know, that's kind of like a story yeah. works that way. There's a conflict sure. and then there's a winner. And it, this is a, a thing that I personally have not seen done this well or maybe even attempted where it's really a conversation the characters themselves have conversations but even the long conversation long conversations like but great, even the, the, great the way that the way that he weaves the elements that are horror with the theme of what those characters are discussing and how those elements then reflect that conflict um without getting into too much detail is brilliant it's genius i think it's magnificent yeah um and those conversations are really really well done within the show, which I appreciate it. You know, I think is one of his strengths as well too, playing off of all that is his characterizations are so strong. Mm -hmm. And when he includes characters that in a lesser storyteller's hand, they'd be cliched. In yeah. this instance, there's a, a, a local police chief who is relatively new to the community and is a Muslim also. Um, and so, you know, that might be played as hacky, you know, in someone who doesn't know how to handle that necessarily. But having someone who is of a different belief system and how that uh, is accepted or not accepted by the members of the community ends up becoming really important to the development of the story. And it's because um, Mike Flanagan, as a writer, has developed not only this police officer character and his young son, um, but the other people around them and how, how dogmatic they are about their religious beliefs. And in that, uh, he raises a lot of points about what religion means for different people. There's a, there's a woman, uh, a female character, who is to me ripped right off the pages of Stephen King. Oh God. Which is someone yes. who is just so laser focused on, um, on her belief system uh, to the point of fanaticism almost. And um, almost reminds me of um, if I had to compare her to any Stephen King character, was it, was it Marsha Gay Harden in the mist? Yes. Who, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, that sounds right. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. 
So, you know, that in that way, when Jake was saying earlier, like he's he does what King ha- does so well, but it's not a ripoff of King in any way, shape or form. Uh, that that I think is one of, of Flanagan's uh, strongest assets. Jakey, where are you at with this? Oh, I, I think it's honestly like nothing short of a masterpiece. I um, but what I think is interesting about it, a lot of people have been asking me, uh, is it scary? Like that's mm. sort of the, the question that I get a lot. And, and here's sort of what I will say is that I didn't find it as like immediately in the moment scary as something like Haunting of Hill House. With Haunting of Hill House, you had not only like what I consider to be maybe the greatest jump scare of all time, but you had the right. unsettling yeah. images that were really hard to shake. You had sort of the, the quick glimpses of the ghosts that he would yeah. place in the background. Mm. Hill House is, is infinitely scarier. Right. Because it's a haunted will, house story. Yes, this is exactly. not a haunted house exactly. story. Exactly. It's and, not what set I, up for those kind of uh, for sure. mechanical scares kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But what I'll, what I'll say is that once I, w- I was removed from Midnight Mass and I could take a step back and look at it in its entirety and really think about what it was saying about religion, about the dangers of reading a book like the Bible literally— what you'll believe, what what people use religion as an excuse to justify and believe. To me, like I'm getting chills just talking about it. To me, that is almost far more terrifying mm. than any of the jump scares that were brought up in Hill. Like Hill House is easy to be like, yeah, it's scarier because of X, Y, and Z. But when you think about what Midnight Mass is saying and how true it is, like I think there are so many points he brings up and things that happen that in my mind I go, yeah, that probably would happen this way in in small town USA. Like mm-hmm. these events, if they were placed into motion, if you put A and B together, C probably is what would come of it. Mm-hmm. To me, that's the scariest thing of all. Yeah. He just taps into something that is within the realm of maybe not, not possible, but very possible in a way. And to me, that that's what horror is. That's that's and again, that's what Stephen King taps into. Sure. And for him, it's not about the monsters that he puts in the book, it's about how humans react to him. And, right. and that's always what he always nailed so perfectly. And that's what King understands. And that's what Flanagan understands. Uh, I love that you asked him about Revival, um, which is a terrific Stephen King book, if yes. anyone hasn't read it, because it, it gets into a lot of these very similar themes, uh, but plays them differently. It's almost like if they're both guitars, they're just guitars in the hands of different musicians. Uh, so they sound that's a really, differently. That's a really great way to put <laughs> that's that. That's awesome. <laughs> that's, but, like, um, that's really cool. All right, I'm done. Thanks. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Hubie, uh, what's this one? Wait, is, that all, is that all we had to do to get you off the show is compliment you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. John, Jesus. you were doing great. It took us 183 work. episodes to figure out. <laughs> um, so Midnight Mass is definitely out there, and we might as well transition over into the Mike Flanagan blend game in case that is somebody's choice. Uh, so we're going to play blend game. Ooh. Hashtag Mike Flanagan blend. And uh, I don't know. Where should I start? Um <sighs> Gabe, is there a suggestion of where I'll I should go. start? I'll you go, go first. I'll go first because I, we're, we're I, saying we're doing ever, ever since Gabe joined, the, like as a main host on this it's episode, like his show he's now. taking the lead. Just well, taking we'll, the lead we'll, in the blend game. We'll get there. Well, okay, so I'll go first because I always preface this with like I'm terrible at picking favorites. My yeah. favorite right now is going to be different by the time we stop recording. Sure, it could be, you know, or yeah. Um, and and I will say that maybe this is recency bias, but Midnight Mass struck me in a way that nothing i've ever watched has mm-hmm. um for very personal reasons um i am not religious i didn't grow up religious i had my mother who raised me was very much she's spiritual and she was very much go explore everything and find out what's right for you which was great which was mm. that's the right attitude i think i'm very fortunate for but i also grew up in the bible belt and so a lot of what i was exploring was just different types of sure. christianity and I never found anything that spoke to me. Um, you know, I looked into some other things, but but religion itself has never spoke to me. Um, and and I've spent my young adult life um, and, you know, in college and all those things, like trying to understand that within myself, but also trying to be understanding of others. When I was younger, I would be much more judgmental. I was never unkind, but I, I would found myself, a thing I didn't like about myself was if someone was this devout religious person, I immediately put them in a box in my head mm. because I had known so many devout religious people that were worthy of that box. Not all are, but, but they were. Um, and so for me, it's something that I've always explored internally, something I'm always trying to learn more about and, and reflect on. And this 
provided, as I said before, a conversation in a way that I've had with myself, I guess, and maybe with a few others. Um, but it's done so well and it's so taught and it's so um, considerate that I just kept falling in love with it. Mm. Regardless of any nitpicks that I have, they were all saved by the fact that he was able to build seven episodes to create this incredibly complex idea and, and set of themes of, of how sort of uh, vague myths and, and blind faith can bring these positive things. You know, communities coming together and, and singing on a weekly basis is a positive thing on its own, on face value. And it can lead you to these wonderful things. But it also can be abused and it can also be misinterpreted. And, and he finds this really, as a you know, fan of horror, this really clever way to tell a horror story with that fact. Um, I love Hill House. Hill House might be best. I don't know. I, I, it's crazy, the stuff that he's done. Dr. Sleep is amazing. Yeah. You know, like it's, he is, he's an incredible filmmaker. He's an incredible storyteller that mm. is doing it on a level that not many can um, or ever have, I think. And I think... As far as the horror genre is concerned, Guillermo del Toro is a master. You know, there are these masters that exist, mm. but because Flanagan comes with such a specific flavor, and he's kind of like, <laughs> it's kind of like uh, the director that Stephen King could never manage himself to be. You know, yeah, it's like we're finally yeah. getting, yeah. we're finally getting that level of horror being yeah. told visually. Mm. Um, it's difficult, but for me, and like I said, maybe it's recent, but Midnight Mass really struck me on a very personal, very particular level that, like I said, I've just never really been, I felt like I've had that conversation with a piece of art before. Wow. Um, and it's done just annoyingly well, just so well. <laughs> it was, it was, I gotta say it was great um, texting with you episode by episode as you were, yeah. cause I had, I had seen all seven around the time that you guys were starting and it was really great to kind of live through, even though I had just finished it myself, live through you guys uh, vicariously. And, and Gabe, I wanna like emphasize your point the reason I think, and I'm not to besmirch Guillermo del Toro, because I like Guillermo del Toro, mm -hmm. um, but the reason I think Flanagan is leaps and bounds better than Guillermo del Toro is that Flanagan is more interested in the people, and I yeah. think del Toro is more interested in the monster. Mm, sure. And yeah. I find that the monster is made better if you give more emphasis to the people. Um, and it doesn't work the other way around. People aren't, the, the human characters are not made more interesting when you put more emphasis on the monster. Um, that's so a really that's, great point. That's an excellent point. When you think about the best examples of the horror franchises that we often speak of, mm -hmm. like you care, you care about Laurie Strode. Um, yeah. you care about Nancy in, you know, the first nightmare. Yeah. Um, and then after that, they become spoofs of the, of it, yeah. the, yeah, the and that's villains, and even, even, you know, exactly where, because they started putting more emphasis on Freddie and Jason and Michael sure. than they did person x that's gonna and, be that has to be killed at, at this part of the, at the and i think sure. that's, that's not to get stuck on guillermo but i think that's why the shape of water uh, i love so much and is probably my favorite film of his because the quote-unquote monster is humanity in that mm -hmm. and the the monster that we visually see sure. is it's all about uh uh sort of um making that monster feel human i think that's mm -hmm. Not that he doesn't, that he disregards humanity completely. I don't think that's what you're saying at all. But, but I think that's the strongest he's ever uh, come on that side of it, is like you're saying. The Shape of Water is great because, like you're saying, Flanagan, in Flanagan's sense, he's always, he's always vying for humanity in his yeah. stories. But anyway, you, so Midnight Mass is my choice. You I think also love Michael Shannon. That I, Michael, well, Michael Shannon is... Well, Michael Shannon loves Gabe. It's very true. We love each other, and <laughs> if we could hang out, listen to music more often... He didn't hug him the way Quentin did, though. That was. That I didn't was very meet. Unique. Uh, we were we were on Zoom, right? We were on Zoom for Michael oh, Shannon. I met no. If I met yeah, Michael Shannon, and also Shannon you don't person, know Gabe's relationship with Michael Shannon. Don't presume true. that you That's, know what what has happened and what has not happened. Fair point. Yeah, very if anybody can, point. if anybody can set us up just to hang out, just listen to music, talk about movies. A la uh, Coach Beard. I think when Gabe leaves the show, he goes on some wild. He adventures. just goes on wild. You should see the pants <laughs> yeah, he's wearing yeah, yeah, right yeah. now. <laughs> That's right. We're always like, yeah, we got Quentin Tarantino, and I was like, oh, sorry, me and Scorsese were having dinner. Quite. Gabe still shows up though. He's like still the mailman. I still He's on up. time and he looks good yeah. in shorts. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, does anyone else want to discuss Midnight Mass before I throw to you? Jake, guys? are you are you picking I, Midnight Mass also? I know. Uh, I was going to say if if we're done with with my pick, mm -hmm. you guys can count down yeah. and and discuss your pick. Hill House because, we have this, because yeah, well, yes. wow, wait oh, okay. a kill gotcha. that. 
<laughs> what? That <laughs> moment. Yeah, no, Jimmy, but, but Gabe, to your point, I think my, my concern about picking Hill House is is our proximity to it i i or midnight mass you mean yeah jesus yeah Uh, yeah midnight mass um if we you know and it was hill house and mass that i was yeah stuck between because hill house is and the fact that like dr sleep is third oh no see i'm choosing between i would choose between hill house and dr sleep i think i think i actually i think i would too um, the only so i would the only thing i would i guess i guess we're not saying best or masterpiece if we were saying masterpiece I would remove Dr. Sleep from the conversation, even though it's justifiably a masterpiece, but because it's not his original. He's sure. got so many great originals that it's like, it's almost wrong to be like... Isn't it though? But And, the, and the, what I mean by that is he took... Yeah, 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 he, you're right. He, yeah, he took Kubrick and he took King. This is my somehow, own made up uh, yeah. rule just no, to I get feel it. better I get about it. I get what you're saying. It. I get what you're saying. Um, Sean, I think you'd... I mean, I, I don't know about you, Sean. I, if you asked me to rank... Hmm the top 10 best individual TV seasons of all time. Like I, I might do, you know, the first season of lost. I might, you know, do this season of that uh, Friday night lights or this mm. season of that show. The, the, the 10 episode season of the haunting of Hill house, I think is one of the single greatest pieces of television in the history of the medium. Like one of the best seasons ever yeah. made. Yeah. Um, I, I would agree with that. It's, it's, it's everything that I love about the genre somehow all put together. It's an, an, an incredible story. It is terrifying. Like some of the, 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 the most unsettling, striking images I've ever seen mm-hmm. in, in the history of horror. Like I know I'm, I'm being hyperbolic, but I don't think I'm, I'm over-exaggerating or giving it too much and credit. And it just I mean, has every... so many ideas. Yeah. It has so that, many ideas. That all snap together into this weird kind of morbid puzzle. I mean, everything even the from fun, the even bit the, neck girl. The bit neck girl. Even the fun, like, um, fun bit about ghosts being around the house is like, yeah. what a what what a fun thing to do. Yeah. That's fun. Episode six. It's what fun. A, and what then a fun you thing see to one do. when you're watching it at night and yeah. you go, holy shit, what the hell is that at the end of the hallway? Or what is that thing that's in the grate? Like, that is one of the most unsettling. Th- and then also... From a technical perspective, and I know we talk about this a lot, but what he accomplished in episode six, mm. I still can't wrap my brain around. Like, like so difficult that he is often talked about, like, never again. Never like, doing not, that again. Never again. <laughs> um, and, and honestly, by the end of the finale, I had tears. Like, mm. actual tears streaming yeah. down my face. So the fact that he somehow blended genuine, actual... Because, I mean, I, I'm a fan enough of the genre so that... Like, it takes a lot for me to think, oh, that was scary. I don't use it as a detriment against anything in horror, but, like, mm-hmm. if it's scary, I'll use it as a bonus. Um, and from a technical perspective and then from an emotional perspective, it's everything I could ever want out of a story in general, much less, a like, a, a horror story. Yeah, the thing about the uh, the unbroken shot in 6, beyond how impossible like i can't watch that and not think of the actors not screwing up yes yes at some point in it like someone flubbing a yeah. line or just yeah. anything and how many times you have to do it but the reason why that shot is is impossible is because it weaves through the two time periods of the story and you know up to that point you know so much about all the characters and the arguments that they are having and then when it goes into the past and you know the fears that the that the characters, the young the young actors and the the parents up to that point and what they're dealing with at that stage um, and then comes back around to the funeral home. And um, it's 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 written so beautifully up to that point so that that scene means so much more beyond. Oh, here's a cool technical element that he's also pulling off. Yeah. The, uh, the reason I elevate Hill House above Midnight Mass for right now is just the ability to tell the two parallel stories, um, the, 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 the younger kids and the younger version of the family and what's happening to them now um, and run them parallel side by side. And I also just think um, in terms of the individual characters, they each had something that was so compelling about them um yeah. from the sister who couldn't do who wore gloves because she was afraid to touch everybody um to uh luke having his um addictions to uh the brilliant performance by um El- he'll always be elliot to me yeah. <laughs> um elliot uh just henry fantastic thomas. yes henry thomas incredible incredible i love that we're getting a henry through. thomas project every year now yeah oh, it's, it's amazing I, it was three episodes into midnight mass before i even realized i was Henry. in fact i yeah. actually looked up to see who that actor was. And then Did I went, you really? That's Henry Thomas? <laughs> That's funny. Um, but I had no the, idea. The payoff of the bent neck lady oh. 
is one of the most masterful things. Um, what a hiding in plain sight kind of just oh. brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, it so is. Yeah. yeah. It so completely is. And I That's even went back. That's a great way to describe it, yeah. This is what this is what honestly pushed this to the top for me. I went I went back and rewatched that that whole sequence of Nell in the house and you know, uh, going up the staircase and dancing with her husband. Remember, all, all oh, of it is just, oh. it's, it's masterful. And what, what annoys me a little bit about Midnight Mass is that because of Hill House, I now know what he's capable of. <laughs> so when I watch Midnight Mass, I'm like, ah, oh, it's just Flanagan being Flanagan. Uh, it's just, it's just, yeah. it's just perfection. <laughs> which is, really I mean, like, which right, is right. kind of something that haunts King as well. Like King turns out. Uh, somewhere between a masterpiece and a pretty yeah. goddamn good novel sure. every year. Sure. But because we've gotten used to it, we kind of take them for granted, for lack of a better phrase. Like, we it's just, so unfair. We write off. Yeah. It's so unfair. Um, but I can't ever get past the first time going through Hill House and waiting for it to go off a cliff and have it get better, you know, yeah. from episode to episode to yeah. episode. Like, didn't you feel by the end of Hill House that you could almost physically feel the house itself as a character, which sounds oh, cheesy. Yeah. Yes. But like when you talk about her going into the house and like when you walk in, you could almost like physically feel how the house was responding to her yeah. when she went in. Like that's how well he wrote it, that he took an empty building and made me know what that building was feeling. Yeah. Well, which is yeah. crazy. And I love that he has this ensemble of actors that, yeah. you know, it feels like he's going to be working with for the, fa- the family for years to called. come. The family. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I think which is they'll... okay if you miss one. Yeah, it's yeah, exactly. Um, and they'll keep rising to you know the challenge of his material. So I look forward to everything they're going to do from here on out. But the other one I would have chose was yeah. was Doctor Sleep because dear God, yeah, the fact that what like something as astonishing as Hush or Gerald's mm-hmm. Game, mm-hmm. um, I I even hate using this expression, but like would be near the bottom of the list. <laughs> yes, is astounding. Yeah, is a, th- those are the bottom of like he doesn't have he's a only, bottom of the list. Yeah, because he's only gotten better and more interesting. Yeah. And you could probably argue, looking back, like the only problem his earlier movies had was that no one was giving him enough money to do yeah. the amazing stuff. Like, yeah, sure. like you look at Hush, and it's a very small, yeah, small well, indie yeah, same with movie, game. but it's done at the highest yeah. level that it could be done under the yeah. under that scope. Here's the thing, though: don't you want him in longer form? Don't you think he's better in longer form? With the the series, you mean? Yeah. Uh, I love the series. I'm in. I'm in. If, yeah. I, I like both. I mean, we talk about how great Dr. Sleep is. If he yeah. can balance giving us a great yeah. The director's cut, flick. though. But well, I mean, honestly, cut, I thought the theatrical yeah. cut was pretty brilliant, too. But, uh, but, I also, but I also love that he tells a story that needs, like, however long, like, Midnight Mass is seven. Like, that's not, that's not a very yeah. sexy number. And I know Under... Netflix normally loves ten. But I love that basically exactly. he just goes, this is... This is how long it needs to be. This is, Under this is someone else, it would have been 10, I think. Because yeah. he, if I were to nitpick Midnight Mass, the, uh, the not necessarily the pace, but he's he's building these characters really mm-hmm. quickly in the first, like, first episode, really, but the first yeah. couple episodes, um, to where there's, it's, there's a little bit of exposition that could be distracting, but it's well done exposition. Mm-hmm. It's not, it's not cheap exposition. Yeah. Um, where I could see that that would get, like, each of the characters that's built out would probably get moved into a different episode and they would elongate it. But the mm-hmm. fact, like I was texting Jake up to like episode three, it was, and I don't mean this as a slight or in a bad way. It was kind of predictable. Like you could, you were seeing the stones that were being laid in front of you. And I was yeah. like, oh, okay, this is interesting. Yeah. This is interesting. And I think this is what's going to happen. Okay. That happened. And it was all rewarding and fine. I don't, I don't mean that as like a, it's predictable rote kind of thing, but then episode three ends yeah. And I said, "Well, now I don't know what the hell." Well, because happen. he's he's kind of like like distracting you with this hand, and you think, "Oh, I know everything that's in that hand," but then you forget about that he's got something going on in this hand. Yeah, that good. you completely. And episode three is basically like, "Oh, remember this hand?" And this is a really weird comparison if you're not watching the YouTube video because I yeah. just did a whole True. visual. <laughs> True, he did it. a magic trick yeah. actually. <laughs> there was a rabbit. All right, let's get to audience picks. Uh, Habs Girl and Paul Marsh says that it's between Hill House and Doctor Sleep. That's not the game. The game is to choose. Yeah, yeah, come on. So oh, you're both them. banned from next week's episode. <laughs> Clint Tomerlin, Guy Anthony, Chris Hutton, and many, many others said Doctor Sleep. Uh, Satith Godi, Danny Gurch, Jeff Cabrera, Kerry Vanderberg, and many others said The Haunting of Hill House. William and Ace Andrew said Hush. So thank you very much for everybody who participated in this week's game. Uh, Gabe, you're going to have to explain next week's for us. We are sure. playing hashtag 
autumn movie blend. So you can let Ooh, us know we... via hashtag or yeah. at realblend at cinemablend.com what your favorite autumn movie is. Yeah. So uh, we are recording on the first day of autumn. Okay. Um, and so this would be autumn time of year. What's what's? It's probably going to be a horror movie. It might be sure. um, something that's not horror. Maybe it's a holiday movie. I don't know. Something in the autumn. When you get to the autumn time, the weather changes. You walk outside. It's a little bit chilly for the first time. What's the kind of movie that you want to watch in that weather? Uh, there's a, I love it. There's apologies awful, to our listeners below the equator. <laughs> <laughs> there's an awful uh, Winona Ryder, I want to say Richard Gere movie called like Autumn in New York. That's your favorite? Uh, your favorite movie with the word autumn in it. Yeah, that's what we're doing. <laughs> it's the only one I can think of, honestly, at this point. Um, Please pick that. Please pick that next week. Maybe I'll rewatch it. No, it's super sappy. It's really terrible. Um, a review. You can send us reviews at realblend.com yeah. as well, too. And this one comes to us from Sam L. Thami 26 from the UK. And he calls it, or she calls it, uh, Essential Listening for Movie Enthusiasts. I have listened to this pod for about two years now, and I am obsessed. I started right from the beginning, and I never miss an episode. I'm a premium blender. Hey, thank you. Premium. And oh, this yeah, pod premium, has premium. inspired me to start my own film podcast. I am also hey. an actor, so it's great to listen the to discussions about the industry. <laughs> yeah, right. Stop that. What are you doing? Don't take <laughs> listeners away from us. Uh, so it's great to listen to discussions about the industry. I love so much. Keep up the amazing work. Hubie, a huge no! Hubie at the end no! of that review. So thank you. Well played. I hate that that caught on. Sam L. Tommy 26 from the UK. Uh, let's see. Next week. Oh, the premium episode that we're going to be recording is a September mailbag, which is mail always fun. Bag, mail you guys bag. send us questions at realblend.com, and then we answer them for you. So you can get access to this and all of the other episodes of Realblend Premium by going to cinemablend.com backslash Realblend Premium. In the meantime, you can listen to all of us, or fo follow us, I'm sorry, on social media, at Jake's Takes, at Kevin McCarthy TV, at Sean underscore O'Connell, at Gabe Kovach, and the show is at real blend we have to have a spielberg ready. i will say so before we'll... we get to spielberg because oh. you almost did it but we can tease next week's guest because we it's recorded it's we true. finish the uh, jake does, does this <laughs> does this group of characters in lord of the rings have a name because we got all three of them on the show now oh interesting do they have um, a name i mean no. it's basically i mean no they don't have a name but it's basically one major plot line of of the two towers in return of the king yeah like because it's the, they're he, mainly together yeah. as yeah. he points out he's not part of the fellowship yeah true and, exactly uh, yeah. that's what i mean and has oh, a reason so for explaining that. So, so completing yeah. whatever we got to give them a name we sure. had earlier a couple weeks ago a couple weeks ago we had elijah wood on and he got to talk about lord of the rings he fantastic did. last december we had um uh, sam wise sam yeah, but no the actor's name sean astin sean astin, sean astin thank you sean Rudy. astin Mikey. Exclusively talking about Lord of the Rings, and next week we will have Gollum himself, Andy Serkis, talking about oh. Venom, but also discussing Lord of the Rings. It's pretty amazing. <sighs> yes, it's pretty amazing. So come back next week. We'll yeah. see you guys Please. then. Until then, Minority Report! Always! Munich? Okay. <laughs> Nothing? Okay, fair enough. I, I wanted to say Finch. <laughs> I just wanted to say Finch. <laughs> <laughs>